Hey, for all the authors that are listening out there, I wanted to share with you this great email that, that we received here at the Reading With Your Kids podcast from Dr. Linda Mubarak. She is the uh, a past guest and the author of Maxine's New Job. Here's the email. Dear Fatima and Jed, good news. Maxine's New Job has been nominated to receive the prestigious Henri Award at the 2018 Christian Literacy Awards for Outstanding Literacy Work in the Children's Book Division. I sincerely believe your certifying Maxine as a great read helped bring increased social media attention to the book. Thank you for the exposure and the great marketing. We are so happy for Dr. Linda Mubarak that her book, uh, Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read, Maxine's New Job, received this prestigious recognition. We would love to help your book receive that same kind of recognition. If you are interested in having your book considered for our Reading With Your Kids Certified Great Read program, please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. You can click on the contact button, send us a, a note, and we'll send all the information back to you, or you can go right to our Certified Great Read page on our website. It's fun, it's easy, and it is really, really a, an effective way to let the world know that your book stands out above all the rest. The Reading with the Kids Certified Great Read Program. Reading with your kids. Hey, 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 so great to see you. Come on in. Hi, my name is Jed Lee, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast and iHeartRadio Best Kids and Family Podcast nominee. We're coming to you from the beautiful Reading with Your Kids studios in the fantastic neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We have a wonderful show for you today, a very, very important show. Our guest is Dr. Deborah Ross Swain. She teamed up with Elaine Fogel Schneider to write Confidence in Joy, Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Differences. Speaking of learning, we would love for you to visit readingwithyourkids.com slash live, readingwithyourkids.com slash live, so you can learn all about our brand new in-school experience called Reading With Your Kids Live. That's right, we're looking for a few great schools to host our all-new in-school experience, Reading With Your Kids Live. We're looking to celebrate our shared love of reading and learning with storytelling, magic, and lots and lots of fun. We may even feature some of your students on a future episode of the podcast. Again, you can check it all out at our website, readingwithyourkids.com slash live. Coming to us from Northern California, she is the co-author of a very important book. It's called Confidence and Joy, Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Differences. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Deborah Ross Swain. Dr. Deborah, how are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me on your show. I'm excited to be here. We're really excited for you to be here, too. Now, t- you know, typically we're... we're interviewing authors of books that we can read with our kids or co-read with our kids. I don't expect that there's going to be a lot of kids reading Confidence and Joy, or there's not going to be a lot of parents snuggling up on the couch with their kids to read Confidence and Joy. But it certainly is a book that uh, parents and professionals will want to be familiar with and, and, and have as a resource. No question about that. There's just such an absence of joy in classrooms across America. But more importantly, classrooms across America are filled with kids who struggle to learn. Mm -hmm. And when children struggle to learn day after day, doing the same thing over and over again, their confidence for learning erodes and certainly with the erosion of confidence, then goes their happiness. Mm -hmm. So... The purpose of this book is to highlight the importance of confidence and joy, of course, in all children, but most particularly children who struggle in school. So there's so much big information in this kind of little book, but parents can grab very specific tips in all 10 chapters that then they can have a conversation with their children about mm. and that's the beauty of this and to, to not only have conversations with their children but conversations with everyone who's involved in the life of this these children because as as parents and as professionals it's our job to get our children from little people to big people 
with confidence and joy in their hearts. And if they have confidence and joy, they can do anything. But for kids who struggle, that by itself, that piece about confidence and joy is a struggle as well. So they don't have to read this to their children. They just have to be informed about it mm-hmm. and then start a conversation. Mm-hmm. Now, it's, 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 there's so much here. I was, I was sharing with Dr. Deborah that my wife has been a special needs teacher for 31 years. And so we, she definitely has a great perspective on this. And, and, and I've learned a lot just hearing from her and helping out with the classroom and, and whatnot. But can you first kind of give us an idea of what percentage of kids are we talking about? Kids who learn differently or who, you know, to take the title from your book, kids, kids who have learning differences. What, what percentage of kids are we talking about? So here's the problem with being able to give you that mm-hmm. specific number. In the U.S., we know how many children have, say, an IEP, which is an individualized educational plan. Mm-hmm. Or we can track how many children have a 504 plan mm-hmm. that provides accommodations. But this book isn't just about children who have a 504 plan or an IEP. It's about children who just learn different, they struggle to learn, but there's not going to be a data point for that because they're not part of a tracking system where they receive special services. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you from my clinical experience, which is over 30 years, I'd say easily, easily 25 to 30 percent of the children. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that that's one of the reasons I I wanted to to ask that question because I am very much aware, even with my own kids, you know, I have two kids who did very, very well in school, but they absolutely learned differently. And my son is one of those kids who is a very bright kid, but really struggled and didn't have, uh, didn't feel a lot of joy in, 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 for certain years uh, of, of his educational experience. Um, and and that was just because there were certain teachers who were able to kind of recognize him and his style and were able to adapt uh, to to his needs. Um, and, and there are other teachers who are a little bit more rigid and uh, you, the kids had mm-hmm. to adapt to their style. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So- yeah and so your, your son is a perfect example of the children that, that really – we're talking about a lot of these children who struggle are off of everybody's radar mm-hmm. and they're, they're not, they don't struggle sufficiently so that they're referred for assessment to be able to get an IEP or a 504. They're just average children for whom reading, spelling and math just do not come easy and they can, these children can look around and see that their school age peers are are all, quote, getting it and they're not, or they have to spend excessive amounts of time learning and mastering a task, or they have to spend excessive amount of times during homework time. Um, it's just those are the children that we have to pay attention to mm-hmm. in terms of what's going on here. We know they can learn, and every child wants to learn, but there's a mismatch between how a child learns and how certain lessons or topics or subjects are being taught and the style in which they're being taught. Mm -hmm. And when there's that disconnect, it just sort of seems like um, the teacher wins. And, And, of course, teachers have large classrooms, and it's hard to make those adaptations and adjustments. But on the other hand, we still want to keep a child's confidence for learning and their joy for learning alive so that it will foster ongoing delights in learning and happiness about what they learn and how they learn. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and uh, one of the things in my experience is a lot of those kids who learn differently are really, really bright kids. Yes, sir. You bet they are. Yep. We, we say that they're bright but feeling dumb Mm-hmm. They're bright but different. And, you know, I'll tell you, that brightness is kind of always um, the surprise for people because they say, well, 
He's so bright, why isn't he getting it? Oh, he must not be motivated. He's so bright, why is he not getting it? Oh, he's just not interested. He needs to try harder. Mm -hmm. The the differences, um, you can't see different. You just see behaviors, and people read those behaviors however they want to. Mm -hmm. A lack of focus, a lack of motivation, a lack of interest, um, just not trying hard enough. Um, being difficult, being um, oppositional, those are just symptoms. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, it's yeah. up to us to figure out why. So what- because they are bright. And, and if you look at the data, especially with children who have a formal diagnosis of dyslexia, they have above average IQs. They're very bright people, but they're frustrated with this struggle that they have with learning. Mm-hmm. What are some of the signs that may give a parent an indication that their child learns differently? Okay, so let's let's talk about maybe the really youngster. Mm-hmm. So when you think about children in preschool, that that is the most fun thing to observe. When you watch preschoolers in a preschool setting, they love to learn. They're inquisitive. They're curious. They just can't wait to learn something new. So an initial red flag is when a child goes from preschool to kindergarten and all of a sudden they don't like school and the lessons that they're being taught aren't making sense to them. Or if a child has can't sit and attend and focus, particularly like um, circle time, or they're having difficulty, say, with rhyming early on or being interested in reading. Um some kids may have some sensory issues. Some kids may have um, issues with communication. Those are red flags. But when a child is a, an active, ex- happy, excited learner, and then all of a sudden they don't want to, that's a red flag. Mm-hmm. Another one is when all of a sudden there are these um, anxiety-like Issues where I've got a stomach ache, I don't feel good, I can't go to school, tears, meltdowns, those are red flags. But then when children get to be, say, in first, second grade where they're being introduced to reading and spelling and they just don't get it, then rather than doing the same way of instruction over and over and over again, the drilling and the drilling or the practice makes perfect kind of model, when that doesn't happen, then that's a big red flag. Um, you may see children who, who withdraw socially, um, who have a lot of crying and around learning, a fear of learning new things, just not wanting to learn. Mm-hmm. Um, those are red flags. And as they get older, when parent conferences come along and you see this disproportionate gap between what their potential is and what their performance is, that's a red flag. And when parents are told, well, they need to try harder, they're not motivated, they need to be a better listener, they're wiggly, those are red flags we all have to work together to figure out why they're seeing those things. Mm-hmm. And, and is, did, go ahead. I was going to say that was one of the things that I, I think uh, is lacking um, it, with a lot of schools: the idea of working together. Um, so, and I, I've heard this from my wife and other teachers as I travel around the country performing uh, my educational magic shows at schools. One of the things that I hear from teachers is that there's, it, it seems like an us against them with the parents coming in and it's, you know, the, 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 the kind of the fists are up and, and we're not here to work as a team to, to figure out the best way to educate this kid. We're just gonna, just gonna duke it out here and there's a, there's a problem. We're gonna have a winner and a loser. And that, I, that doesn't seem like a healthy way to approach the subject. So I couldn't agree more because when in that scenario, the loser is the child. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, so in our in our confidence and joy book, there's a, an entire chapter about building teams. Mm-hmm. And when I meet with families in my practice and I evaluate a child and we're discussing now what the next steps are, I always say, 
we need to form a team Ryan or a team Adam or a team Jesse or a team Ella, whoever it is. And that team works together and is committed to this child's overall success. Now, that doesn't mean that we have to sit down together at a table because if there are four or five of us, we're in four or five different locations and four or five different schedules to contend with. Mm -hmm. But as long as we have a mechanism for sharing information and establishing collaborative goals and often those little baby step objectives and we're all doing it consistently, then the outcome for the child is fantastic. But this isn't a time for people to um, have their own agendas or to have any ego involved. The center of this team is a child. Mm -hmm. And we all have different gifts and talents and skills and knowledge and abilities that we have to bring together and form this strategy for the most effective and optimal outcomes for children. No child should should be excluded from that model. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, as a professional uh, helping families and kids find success in schools for for more than three decades, what kind of changes have you seen in the educational system or or within families? And uh, are things getting better? Are there are there more problems? So that's a that's a really good question. I. I can't really change educational systems, mm -hmm. but what I do do is I empower professionals and I empower especially families and help them develop a plan for helping these children who struggle achieve success. So we talk about it as a group. And we talk about how parents can go to bat for their children, how teachers can go to bat for kids in an IEP, how they recognize that, that children aren't trying to not learn, mm -hmm. how by imposing consequences or um, repercussions or incentives, that can't change how a child's brain works. Mm -hmm. So we have to work around that. But ultimately, if you have a, a child that is given an opportunity to feel confident in their learning and who can then be happy about their ability to learn, they're going to get one little success after another. I always say we have to give children more vitamin S so that they feel empowered to be, to learn. But they don't know that. They, they're dependent on the big people in their lives to create opportunities and environments for them. Mm -hmm. And when that doesn't happen, they're the ones who suffer. So in answer, that is a long shaggy dog way of me answering your question, but it's about empowering families one at a time and providing and sharing information with teachers one at a time. And that's part of my written report is that I, I recommend that we collaborate. I recommend that we form teams and I recommend that we form communities of support for children who just lack confidence and joy. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a group effort. Why do you think it's so difficult sometimes for us to acknowledge the fact that kids learn differently? I, you know, we, we we see a kid who has a mobility issue and we understand well that kid needs a, a walker needs a wheelchair to, to to move around or we see a child who has a severe developmental disability and we recognize oh, okay well this this kid has to have a one on one and, and and this kid's you know goal in, at at age 7 or 8 years old is to learn how to feed him or herself as opposed to reading but when it comes to, you know, a, a kid who is, you know, needs to learn more experientially than just sitting down and, and, and taking in lessons, why is it so hard for us to recognize that need? Boy, well, it's kind of like where to start with that. Um, probably the biggest, the biggest problem with that ha goes back to what I said a little bit ago is, you can't see the brain learning, mm -hmm. but what you do see are behaviors, and people focus on the behaviors. And the behaviors, depending on who's looking at them, 
they assign characteristics, either positive or negative. So recognizing that there are learning differences and the scope of that and the um, spectrum of that is a huge spectrum of learning differences. But you are you are so right. Why can't we? Well, classrooms are huge and we're, we're educating the masses and teacher education is around learning curriculum. So I, I feel that it's just not enough time, not enough information. But in my experience here is that because the first thing they see, meaning educators, um, are behaviors that are not conducive to learning, like tuning in and out, wiggling, um, having sensory issues. And the underlying that is, what if they have a short-term memory problem? And what if they have a comprehension problem? And what if they have a working memory problem that interferes with that, with their ability to learn, that they look just like the other kids? Mm -hmm. See, we can't see it, and so we assume it's not there. It's like you can see that child who has difficulty ambulating, so has a walker. Or you do see a child who who has profound developmental difficulties and they may be in a wheelchair. But we, it's like if you can't see it, then, then what is it? Mm-hmm. How do we work with it? Mm-hmm. But we do see an unhappy child. We do see a child that lacks confidence. That should be our big, our meaning the professional's red flag here. Now we have to know what it looks like Mm -hmm. and we can see educational defeat or learning defeat in the form of lack of success, lack of achievement, despite everybody's very best efforts, Mm -hmm. lack of confidence, lack of joy, anxiety, depression. Those are what we see. For a parent whose child is experiencing these, these these issues in school and and doesn't have the confidence and is not experiencing success. Wh- how can your book help in in that conversation with between parent and child? It, is your book going to give the parents the the knowledge that they need to kind of explain to to that child? Well, you you just learn a little bit differently, and we're going to work together. We're going to find a way. To, um, to help you become successful. That's right. You know, the children figure it out really early on when they're not getting what the other kids are getting. Mm-hmm. So when that, when that starts to rear its ugly little head, then parents just say, hey, you know what? You learn differently. We're all different. I learn differently with math. You learn differently with math. So-and-so, your brother, your sister, your friends, it's not a problem. We just have to, and we're going to, figure out how we can help you learn the information that you need to learn. Mm-hmm. We'll figure it out. Mm-hmm. And and the parents will if they're committed to it. Um, and then working with educators so that different doesn't mean bad. Different doesn't mean disabled. Different doesn't mean disordered. And that's where the confusion comes in. You know... People say my child has a learning disability, and that doesn't mean anything except that they have difficulty learning. Is it a disability or is it a difference? Mm -hmm. But if you say my child has a physical disability, everyone says, oh, what's wrong? Mm -hmm. What's What makes them disabled? And you can list a, a number of reasons why a child may be physically disabled, but we don't have that. We say learning disabled when really most of these children are learning different. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And disable, when you use that term, there it's a disability. Well, that's disempowering. Mm -hmm. So we have to turn that around so that it can be empowering. And so one of the questions I ask parents is, what is your child really good at? And they'll tell me, and I said, so they need to have as much of the, the success in that and others like that so that it balances the, the, the struggle that they have in school Mm -hmm. so that they don't feel like, they're, they're spending six hours a day struggling and one hour a week feeling good about themselves. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, there's, there's so much going, you know, uh, you, you 
what, what you're just saying reminds me of the um, kids that, that I went to school with who were phenomenal athletes and could th- could throw a ball with with precision and hitting a moving target, but they would struggle in school. And I didn't realize at the time, and no one in, in, in the class ever pointed out to, to those students that, hey, you're actually doing like physics and calculus. When you're throwing that ball and you're calculating where it needs to be to meet that person as they're running, that's a pretty complex thing. And, uh, you know, if, if you're able to do that kind of in your head visually, we're going to find a way for you to figure out to be successful in school and use that, that natural intelligence and, uh, to, to, to help you be successful. That is exactly right, and we, that's the model that we use mm-hmm. because there are things that these kids who struggle with reading, spelling, and math are fabulous at, stuff that none of us can do. Many of them are really good at, like, engineering with Legos mm-hmm. or they're, they're masters at dance or art or theater or music, and so... Reading, spelling, and math is not the only way to measure success. Mm-hmm. So that's what you're, you're exactly right. How a child can use pen and ink and create these drawings or the f- amazing Lego constructions I see that they do, those are our future engineers and scientists. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And I, I think one of the things that we forget is, you know, we, we, as, as adults and as parents, we look and we see a child succeeding in math and reading and, and whatnot, and they, they're going, oh, yeah, they're using their brain. They have really intelligent brains. But we see a child who may be struggling academically who is performing in ballet or on the athletic field, and we go, well, what, they have great control over their body. Well, their brain is what's controlling their body. So, you know, it's, there's, there's intelligence up there that we just need to tap into and, and help the child tap into. Correct. And, and also change everyone's perception of what success is mm-hmm. and look at it as it's multidimensional. It's huge. Mm-hmm. And to celebrate all their successes because The more success they have, the more confidence they have, and the happier they are. And we really need to work, do better and work harder at helping these children feel that profound sense of confidence and joy in all these various areas so they don't feel like, oh, academics is better than art or academics is better than athletics because they're all about building success Successful and happy and confident kids grow up to be happy, confident, successful adults, mm-hmm. and that's what we need. Absolutely. You know, one of the things, and, and, and just just correct me if, if you disagree, but I'm, 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 I'm thinking about a conversation. I'm thinking about confidence and joy, success strategies for kids with learning differences. And, yeah, we talked about the fact that there's probably 25, 30 percent of kids out there who do learn differently. Well, I think that this book can be a great help to the other 75, 70% of kids out there and, and families because I think it's the information in, in this book that, that parents can, can read and perhaps share with those kids who don't have learning differences is that information can help those quote unquote typical, typical kids have more empathy and more understanding for their classmates and maybe f- find ways to support their classmates to be successful and confident. Absolutely. Absolutely. This message is for everyone. It's for everyone because I'll tell you, even children that don't have learning differences on a day-to-day basis, like the ones that we're talking about, they're going to they're going to struggle to learn something along the way, and they're going to know what it feels like. Mm-hmm. And it feels yucky. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But for them, it's just temporary. Right. And yes, it will develop more empathy and compassion. Because we all live here together. We're on this planet together. And we have to take care of one another so that we provide generations of individuals who have confidence and joy. Mm-hmm. Because if you don't have it, you can't model it and you can't teach it to another generation. Absolutely. 
Well, I, I, I think I could talk to you all night long. This is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. But we want folks to be able to get as much information as they can. So tell us where folks can find out more about Confidence and Joy on the net. Okay, so you can go to confidencejoy.com. And let's see, my email, you can email me directly, is dswain at the swaincenter.com. And I'm on Facebook under Deb Swain, and I'm on LinkedIn under Deb Swain. So that's the way you can reach me. Awesome way. So many ways. It's just such a wonderful world that we're living in. We have so many ways to connect with each other. And it's wonderful that we have a book like Confidence and Joy, Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Differences, so we can help find different ways so that all kids can be confident and successful. So one other thing, you can the book is available on Amazon. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And it's the number one best-selling nationally and internationally on Amazon. That's, that's wonderful. Congratulations. Thank you. Tonight we've been talking to one of the co-authors of Confidence and Joy Success Strategies for Kids with Learning Differences. Um, she co-wrote the book with Dr. Elaine Fogel-Schneider, and our guest tonight has been Dr. Deborah Ross Swain. Dr. Deborah, thanks so much for being with us tonight. Hey, thank you so much for inviting me. It was awesome, and you asked great questions, and I thank you for that. Please be sure to join us for the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be New York Times bestselling author James Riley. He is going to be here to talk about his book, Revenge of Magic, and so much more. That's the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Hey, if you are the author of a great children's book, we would love to have you as a guest on the podcast. Being a guest on the podcast gives you a chance to tell thousands and thousands of people about your great children's book. Being a guest, it's fun, it's easy, and it doesn't cost you a thing. To learn more, please visit our website, readingwithyourkids.com. Click on the contact button. Let us know about your great book. We'll let you know the next easy step. Hey, we want to thank Dr. Deborah Ross Swain for being here today. And, of course, we want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And, as always, thank you so much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading with Your Kids podcast.